Professor Peter Rowe obtained his secondary education at England and post-secondary education at Toronto and University of Waterloo in Canada. He joined the University of Waterloo in 1959 at the Department of Mathematics and moved to the Department of Electrical Engineering in 1960, which he has served for nearly five decades in various capacities. He has served several terms as Chair of the Department of Systems Design Engineering and is presently the Director of International Exchange Programs at the University of Waterloo. Over a career spanning five decades, he has taught a wide variety of subjects, both at the University of Waterloo and abroad, at levels from adult education to advanced postgraduate study. He was a member of the team that designed and taught the first undergraduate engineering design course ever offered in the United States in 1963, has published over 150 technical refereed journal and conference papers, authored four books, and several articles of general interest for the public press. He initiated the concept of student computing in engineering using the local area network, which established the design parameters for the Watchstar system, later on evolved into the campus-wide Nexus system at the University of Waterloo. DEI has on, was honored to host Professor Rowe at the International Seminar on Spiritual Awakening Sources in January 2008. He was the chief architect for the MOU, which was signed between DEI and the University of Waterloo in July 2008. And he has been honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Albag Educational Institute for his lifelong contributions to the systems movement. I have great pleasure in inviting Professor Rowe to deliver his plenary talk. Thank you very much, Satish, for that pleasant uh, introduction. And uh, revered Dr. Satsangi, it's a great pleasure to see you here uh, taking in these, these presentations, especially the ones that have your, uh, you, you and your relations on. And uh, also uh, to all the delegates and, uh, and invited guests, thank you very much for being here. And um, my um, talk is historical. So it's not like uh, Mukti's presentation where everybody joined in. And it's not like the previous ones which are talking about really future applications of, of system theory. I'm talking about old ones. So. Um, it will be old ones, and and although the the um, the preceding um, volume that everyone, all delegates have received, have got my paper, I will try to follow it a bit, but uh, it's not necessary that I will stay with it, because I have things to say about various people, some of whom are actually in this room, that you may not have heard before. Now, the outline of the, of the um, Presentation. First, I'll talk about graph theory and how it began, and then about uh, Gustav Kirchhoff and his laws. Then I'll jump forward and we'll talk about what was going on after the Second World War and in the 1950s. And then I'll do a little digression and talk about alternative ways of looking at system analysis, some of them, mostly flow graphs and bond graphs. And then I will talk about what I know, because all the rest is uh, what I've heard, which is what went on in the last four decades of the 20th century at the University of Waterloo, because I was there all the way through those four decades. And then I will try and get, come to an end. If I fail to come to an end at that time, you can, uh, set, Satish, yes, you're the, you're, you're the um, session chairman. You can get a hook and pull me off the stage. So. Let us begin. First of all, graph theory. Now, it, it is common knowledge that graph theory was started uh, by Euler in, in uh, the 18th century, and it started with the burgers and bridges of Konigsberg. And the nice thing about Konigsberg is it's kind of like Madras. Madras. It's not called Madras anymore. It's called Chennai. Konigsberg is not called Konigsberg anymore. It's called Kaliningrad because the Russians changed its name. But um, it sort of brings a sort of a connection with what goes on in this country. Um, by the way, if you Google Konigsberg, you will come up with this map that's here. And it has the, the famous bridges, um, the famous bridges uh, completely um, 
outline. There are more bridges, by the way, over the, over the river, and nowadays not all those bridges are still there, but that's a different matter. If you, um, and here's a, the next slide has a um, uh, sort of generalized view of the whole thing. And, uh, and what you have to note is that if you want to walk like the burghers of Konigsberg did, from one landmass to another on a Sunday morning, and start on any one of them and, and end up where you began, you would have to have always an even number of bridges connecting each of the particular landmasses. That's, that's what um, uh, Euler uh, discovered. And, uh, and therefore, you get the idea of an Eulerian graph. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the next, uh, uh, which is a graph which is, a uni which is in fact, a union of edge disjoint circuits. Now, there's a picture of Euler. He, uh, I put on the slide his famous identity, that's the e to the i pi plus one is equal to zero, because that's what he's, I think, most famous for. He did solve the Konigsberg bridge problem, and he did start uh, graph theory, but he didn't even think in terms of graphs. He thought in terms of paths. And, it, um, and nobody thought about uh, graphs in the 18th century. It took them at least a century to start thinking about linear graphs, but still, they all began, I think, with Leonard Euler. Let's go to the next slide. I might actually, if I go on at this rate, I've only got 19 slides. Uh, if I go on at this rate, I'm actually going to finish before 150 minutes are over. Here's the, um, here, here is the um, stylized version of the same bridges, and there's the graph, and you can see that it doesn't have um, an even number of, uh, sorry, you know, the degree of each vertex is not even, and so therefore it's not an Eulerian graph, and so, so therefore it's quick. You can't start anywhere and end anywhere in the same place, going over every bridge on a Sunday morning stroll. You know, that's the way it is. Uh, going over every bridge once. But, by the way, if you took away one of the bridges, for instance, the one between, these ones are numbered rather than lettered, the one between vertices, say, uh, one and four, um, you could start at two and end at three by an Eulerian path, because that would make the appropriate number of, of um, even, even degree vertices. Now, let's move on. One whole century, or roughly one whole century, and here you have a postage stamp from the DDR. That's the former communist portion of East Germany. And it's a postage stamp of Gustav Kirchhoff. And the one major connection between him and Euler is that he has a connection also with Konigsberg. He was born there. I didn't know that, actually, but uh, uh, there he is. He's not a baby in that, uh, in that picture. He's a, an older gentleman. He, of course, brought us the famous laws, Kirchhoff's, uh, or Kirchhoff, depending on how you care to pronounce him, voltage and current laws. And those are the, the laws that led to the whole body of topological network analysis. But nobody thought about that in a particular way. He was only talking about, about uh, resistive networks. In fact, what he was interested in, things like Wheatstone bridges. And what did you do? Uh, the, the graph, or the network, was just the, the whole thing with the resistances taken out, and you had lines instead. And it took quite a little while, a very long while, before that was generalized. And, uh, and that generalization took place much later. But in the meantime, we get to top, yes. In the meantime, that's to say in the ensuing century, I want to get on to the modern bit. I'm just going over this uh, history quickly. In the meantime, we had the topological network analysis. And people started to realize that you could find uh, ratios of um, tree admittance products and two tree admittance products. And those things would give you, um, um, what would you give you? They would give you solution of linear systems. Uh, sorry, they'd give you solution of networks because you got the ratio of the two, and that would give you a transfer function between one place and another. And, uh, and that worked. So that was the determinant, you know, you, you observe that the determinant of AA transpose, which A is the instance matrix, is equal to the number of trees. And the determinant of AA, y, a, y, a transpose is equal to the, um, the sum of tree admittance products. And if you do it with two trees, whoops. So all of those things 
lead to, you know, by inspection. If you can, if you can enumerate the number of trees in the graph, you can find the determinant of the, of the, uh, well, the, the um, transfer admittance uh, products and so forth, just by looking at the graph. That was the whole idea, and that's the way it went. I read some papers that were presented, for instance, in China by a fellow by the name of Wang, the Wang algebra of networks, uh, in the in the 1930s. So um, this was culminated, you'd have to say, in a series of papers in a variety of places. The, the famous names involved in the 50s would be uh, Talbot in England and Percival in England and uh, um, Sundaram, Sesh Sundaram Seshu. I don't know anyone here who ever, does anyone? So now we move on. We've, uh, we've dealt with all of those things and what happened? We've got the situation where we've World War II. And what happened then? Well, in World War II, and in the years just immediately preceding it, there was a, a major increase in scientific knowledge. There was a major increase in engineering works. You know, we had the invention of, well, rocketry. We had the invention of the cathode ray tube. We had the invention of radar. We had the invention of jet engines. And, and, and television and all of those things happened and, and it took some time before engineering education caught up. In, prior to the war, Second World War, engineering education seemed to be sort of handbook stuff. You did it by experience, you didn't do it by science. And what spearheaded the change was really all of these inventions associated with well, what was then called modern technology. It's now kind of, kind of old. And it would seem, to my mind, that one needed to search for complete methods for linear system analysis because they became more complicated. One needed to deal with, with first with electrical circuits because they were more complicated. One needed to look at uh, more scientific and mathematical ways of teaching engineers. And this was spearheaded at MIT in the United States and, and at, at Imperial College also in the United Kingdom. So they all happened very quickly. In fact, when I was a student at the University of Toronto in, this is in the 50s, in 1957, uh, I was being taught a, um, a course on what was called advanced mechanics. And the um, Sputnik went up. And my professor, who was a rather dull and dry old guy, um, was, was teaching from notes that he had written prior to World War II. And he would turn over the page and say, take this down. And, uh, and that's how you sort of got the stuff. Suddenly he changed. He said, I'm going to change my whole course. I'm going to teach you orbital mechanics. And, and, we, and he brought out his real knowledge, which was kind of nice, and we, taught, we learned about why you had to deal with, with heating when you're returning into the atmosphere. And, and what, was we, what was known as escape velocity. We didn't know anything about this. Nobody did, right? But Sputnik was out there beeping away and, uh, and uh, it changed, that changed the way actually the University of Toronto, which was a, an exceptionally um, backward place in those days as far as I was concerned. I was a student there so I can say it. Um, so there was a huge increase in research activity in North America and in Europe. And we're talking 1950s. All of a sudden, the Republic of India decided to do something about, uh, about higher education in engineering, and the, and the IITs were formed. And uh, the University of Waterloo took its first students in in 1957. I joined it in 1959. And I can tell you, that that first decade after the war was when things were really accelerating in engineering education. And I was very happy to be in a brand new institution uh, and uh, find out what was going on. So now let's just quickly look what was going on in the 50s in the States. And uh, because this is where um, graph theoretic system modeling came from. And you look at the late 1950s. And I've got a picture of Ernst Gillem in there. Ernst, that was taken actually before the war. There he is teaching circuit theory in MIT. And he, he, wrote, he wrote a number of books. 
He was the, uh, he was the PhD supervisor of a number of people uh, from whom uh, are academically descended, people like Hermann Koenig, Mac van Volkenburg, uh, and so forth. And uh, he, um, and by the way, Seshu, the Seshu I've just, you, you people don't know uh, Sundaram Seshu. He taught me, um, he was a student of, uh, he was a student of van Volkenburg at, at Illinois. And he uh, proceeded, and he was an associate with M.B. Reed, who went, later moved to uh, Michigan State. So that's, uh, and, and then you see Horace Trent. Horace Trent was the person who published a milestone paper in the Journal of Acoustical, I've forgotten the name of the journal, but it's, it's in, my, uh, it's in the, my, my talk, and he was in my paper, and he was, uh, he was the person who put into the minds of people how to deal with linear systems, at least the idea of dealing with lin linear systems, not just as analogies with electrical networks. So there were mechanical engineers who would deal with vibrating systems, and one, the, the way they would do it was they would draw the analogy with an electrical network because dampers can be related to, to resistances and so forth. And then they would draw the electrical network, and then they would use the topological formulas which Seshu and Maeda had done a lot of work on, and, uh, and then they would go back to the original system. And that's a rather stupid Way, not stupid, it's a rather unfortunate way of doing things because you don't need to refer to analogies. And indeed, it was Herman Koenig, uh, by the way, Peter Bryant, I should just mention him. Peter, Peter was, uh, wrote some papers on, uh, one of them was called The A Matrix of Electrical Networks. It was a fairly famous paper, probably in the um, IEEE. And, um, it, and he also came to the University of Waterloo and was there along with a number of other people during that rather expansive period of time. And uh, he was kind of a nice fellow. I liked Peter a lot. Um, um, so, but it was Herman who, uh, who really cottoned on to the very simple idea that Sashu and Maeda formalized the topological formulas, Trent. Uh, broadened thinking about analogies and Koenig established, this is it, he established the idea of a system graph as more than the geometry of a network. It was he who, who produced the simple idea, it's a simple and elegant idea, that a terminal graph could represent the pairs of measurements of complementary through and across variables at the terminals of components <coughs> and the corresponding sets of equations among those variables that could, at least in principle, the variables could at least be deduced from direct measurements in a laboratory would create a complete external model of a device and that remains fundamental to the whole structure of graph theoretical system analysis. Without it, you don't have the system. With it, you do. And because you can interconnect components at their terminals, you interconnect their terminal graphs and boom, you've got a system graph and everybody who's, and everybody who's been a DEI uh, clearly knows this because that's something which has been developed here in a big way. And I'm, I am truly enheartened about systems theory when I see people doing things in areas that I had never thought one might apply it, such as uh, quantum computing. Now, I will get on to, uh, I'll just do a little bit of a diversion to flow graphs and bond graphs. And I, it's funny, when I wrote this paper, I left out uh, system dynamics, but, but, but that was equally developed by people like Forrester and Meadows. So there were, coming out of MIT, where Gilliman was, there were people thinking about how to model systems. And the, the models that were different from the linear graph models essentially are the block diagram models, which are still to this day used in the analysis of, of uh, simple control systems. The flow graph models of Mason and his colleague Coates, they're slightly different, and the bond graph models which are, were invented at MIT by um, Harold Painter. And it's important that one should know that, they were, that these things were developed at a very similar time, in fact the same time, as the graph theoretic models. And of course, there are relations among them, because if you're going to an analyze a particular system, you'd better come to the same results, whichever type of modeling technique you use. 
So therefore, therefore one knows a priori that they are absolutely uh, equivalent. You can start with the one and get to the other. But the matter is that if you're interested in knowing the interaction of components, then you should go to the graph theoretic model. If you're only interested in uh, transfer functions, which gets you limited to linear systems, then you can consider yourself going to the flow graph models. And, uh, and there are formulas and there are ways of reducing these things and then they're quite easy to, they're quite easy to learn. I learned them a long time ago and I've forgotten them since. Uh, but, 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 the, but how to do flow graph models of, of, uh, of a linear graph system, I, I put that in my PhD thesis, that's a fair distance of time ago. And, uh, and then there are the bond graphs which describe energy flow. If you're interested surely in, in, purely in energy flow through a system and you don't care about the relationships of components, you'll go to bond graph models. And if you want to learn about bond graph models, I invite you to go to where? To Lille, Ecole Centrale de Lille in France, or to uh, the university called Twente, Twente it's, it's pronounced, uh, in, in the Netherlands. And there you find great hives of bond graphers. Um, and there are one or two of them all over the world, including some of my students. So the, the, if you don't know about them, they're interested in, interesting because they're graph-like. And they're linear graph-like. And you can, of course, derive the one. You can, of course, derive uh, the bond graphs of a system from the linear graphs of a system. And you can do the reverse. My, my, one of my later PhD students actually worked out the com complete equivalence between the two. And they're not all that easy. Because for a bond graph, there is always um, a dual. And for a graph, there is not always a dual. And so when you want to, to uh, look at how you deal with those things at, the, um, at uh, the equivalence one way or another, you have to look at the underlying circuit and co-circuit matroids of the graph, which is uh, associated with the graph, which is getting a little deeper. So um, let's uh, move on to what happened with, with Herman, because something did, right? He went to Flint, Michigan, from Illinois in about 1956. Is that correct? I don't know the date precisely. Uh, others who were there include, of course, M.B. Reed. Uh, and then there was Tokat and D.P. Brown, who was there. I think D.P. Brown was still there, Jack, when you were there. Yeah, yeah D.P. Brown. And of course, there was H.K. Keshevan, who had completed his master's degree at Illinois and became one of Koenig's, I think, Koenig's first PhD student. I'm not sure. So first system theory could generate, could, can generalize circuit theory to include rotating machinery. And then uh, we could perhaps go to other things like uh, transistors and, 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 elect, and, and tube. I don't know whether you call them tubes or valves in this country. When I grew up in, as a teenager, you know, they were called radio valves. And when I went to the United States, they were called electron tubes. Nobody calls them anything nowadays because they've been superseded I saw it state devices. But anyway, so what did we do at the University of Waterloo? Well, the first thing was Keishwan wanted to, to generalize system theory. And when he came to our new department in, um, when did he come to our new department? It was 1968. He came back from Kanpur. Keshavan, had been uh, the, the head of electrical engineering for a short time at the University of Waterloo. Then he went back, came back here to Kanpur, where he was dean of graduate studies, started the computer center, and I think he was chair of electrical engineering, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and then we sent one of our, our colleagues, a, a great friend of mine by the name of George Sulis, back to this country to re-recruit Keshevan, and by golly, he succeeded where my student uh, V.K. Autry was, as well as a postdoctoral fellow at the time. Um, and uh, Keshevan called me and he said, we have to have a new curriculum in, uh, for our systems design program. And I said, oh, that means, that's fine. I designed the electrical engineering curriculum in a weekend. We should be able to do it pretty quickly. So 
So we, uh, he called me back and we, we set up the, the new undergraduate program and we had the Department of Design and then we decided to set up the new curriculum in, which involved a great deal of system theory and since we were doing both design and systems we called it systems design engineering and it has been that way ever since and the curriculum that Cash and I designed over two or three meetings in the fall of 68 lasted a, and has lasted a very long time so it was it was d d dynamic what I'm trying to say it was a dynamic experience we didn't have the sort of um, problem of, of an academic structure which, uh, which held you back so that you couldn't change the curriculum. Again, Prem uh, Kara talked about some of the IITs being rather slow at changing their curriculum and, uh, and, uh, and I know that the University of Toronto where I was was exceedingly slow at doing it um, and, and yet it was known at that time as the best place in Canada. Um, they've, they've reformed themselves since then. Um, so it's possible to set up new things and to do it and we set it up so that we could generalize. We, we, our new curriculum was going to be, is this, that one's live, maybe I should be talking into it. The, um, we wanted, he wanted to have a, a program that would deal with system analysis and design and let's say physical systems and then with socio-economic systems and with human systems, human, we did what was known as human systems design, that's ergonomics and various things like that. Those were the three, the three prongs of the department. Well, and he said, well, we've, in the physical systems, we're going to have to do things like um, generalizing what we're doing in physical systems. And, in, and we're going to bring in socioeconomic systems and we're going to bring in human systems. So there were all sorts of people there. Um, and, uh, um, it was really quite auspicious to be there. Let me tell you about a few of the people from this subcontinent who were there. There was Vijayasagar. I'm sure people know Vijayasagar, who's just recently retired from TCS. There was Mahabala, Mahabala and Vishwanathan, both of them IIT Kanpur people. There was Kishore Singhal. There was K.D. Savastava, a uh, high voltage man. These are all people at the University of Waterloo. And there was S.T. Aryaratnam. Now Aryaratnam came from what was then called Ceylon. Um, his father was a prison manager. I, when he went on sabbatical leave to Ceylon, you would address a letter to, to uh, it was still a monarchy, Ceylon at that time. Uh, you would address a letter to, to, to Arya uh, Ratnam, and it would be S.T. Arya Ratnam, care of Her Majesty's prison, <laughs> because that's where they lived, which I always thought was kind of funny. You would think he was a prisoner. He was actually a rather, um, rather, um, erudite young man. He's not young anymore, but he's still erudite. Um, the place was full of what I'll have to call bright, upperly mobile academics, and there were quite a lot of results. Talking about where the results were coming, well, we had Prem Satsangi, who, um, who uh, was interested in socioeconomic systems. We had Mutu uh, Chandrasekhar, M. Chandrasekhar, I don't know anyone, if people know Chandrasekhar, he was an IITK person. He, um, he would, his, his thesis was um, on pipe networks um, and if you were, have a civil engineering background, it, it really, you know, using Chandrasekhar's results, you could design water supply and, uh, for new developments in a way that was deterministic, which was kind of nice. And then there was M.V. Bhatt, um, I think he was also from from one of the uh, IITs. And uh, we had a person, my student, whose name was Deva Sagayam Pillai. I think his first name was Sitharaman. Sitharaman Deva Sagayam Pillai. Now the problem with him was that he had a very long name. And when he went to use his name, he would use fragments of it. <laughs> and it depended on which fragment he was actually going to use. So. He, he was a, a Sri Lankan and uh, he um, went to the University of Calgary, I think. Maybe it was the University of, of Alberta, in, but I can't remember which one, to do a master's degree. And he used one name. And it wasn't the same name as he used when he was uh, at his university in Sri Lanka. And then he came to the University of Waterloo 
and he had different letters which had different names. And at one point, the graduate office had two complete files on this applicant, one under one name and one under another. But they were reconciled, and he came to me and became my, my, my student in uh, power, system, power system planning. And, uh, but he, and, and he got the PhD. Later on, he went to the University of Toronto, where he continued his practice of using different names. <laughs> different partial names, and he also worked for the World Bank using similar strategies. And finally, when the U, U of T caught up with him, he was enrolled in two, diff two different undergraduate programs under two different names. And so they came back to the University of Waterloo and they said, um, did he actually get his PhD? And the answer was he did, because they also went to the University of Alberta and said, did he get his master's? And the answer was, no, he didn't. <laughs> And then they went back to Sri Lanka and said, did he ever get his bachelor's degree? And the answer was, no, he didn't. So his first earned degree was his, was his doctorate, which was kind of clever. He later got from our management department a master's degree. And, a, and somewhere in the Toronto, he got a, a bachelor's degree. He did his, his degrees in absolutely the wrong order, backwards. But he was also nearly put into jail because of what he was doing with his names. That's, uh, that's my friend, Davis Guy and Pillai. Uh, Chandrasekhar. I mentioned he, he worked on simulation programs. He, he wrote a, 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 a set of software called ProSim for doing graph theoretic analysis just before his death. And followed up after him was Chad Schmitke. Schmitke uh, wrote the software that is used for um, training Canadian astronauts to, to run the, the um, uh, robot arms on the, on, the, on the satellites and things which can fun. Then we had uh, Gordon Andrews, who was a Canadian. He, he, his work was on, um, what was it on? Three-dimensional mechanics. He wrote uh, a lot of stuff on that. And, and uh, his student, John McPhee, who is still there, um, you're ringing the bell. It's too soon. <laughs> um, I haven't got there yet. I've got four more slides to go. And I've still got another 100 minutes. OK. And so there was John McPhee, who, who's, whose work is uh, on design of automotive, automotive stuff using uh, graph theoretic methods. And uh, then we had F.C. Wong. Wong was a student of Shaker, and, uh, sh and his work was on thermodynamic systems. So there was a fair number of bits going on. Let's get some more of this stuff, because I'm, I'm told to hurry up. Um, but also, I'll hurry. Um, we had. So what are the things we did? We did sensitivity analysis. My student, uh, who is here in Delhi at the moment, Ashok Seth, um, his thesis was on sensitivity analysis. And it was, it, it, he went on to a very distinguished career, as you all probably know. Uh, we did distributed systems. So that is to say systems whose, whose components are, are characterized by partial differential equations. So we did everything that would uh, be rather equivalent to finite element method. We did probabilistic systems. Some of my students, some of my students, and I'm trying to think who or which, um, um, did work on systems whose, whose parameters are, are uh, drawn from probability distributions. Equivalence of the graph theoretic method to bond graphs and flow graph methods. And, established the, the rigorous mathematical connections rather than it just seems to work. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about A.K. Sekt because Ashok was a, a, a very brilliant man, but he was in a car accident. And the car he was in was driven by another Indian student. You should never let Indian students drive cars in, Toronto, in Canada because they go too fast. Um, and he had only got his le driver's license. He went down the highway 401 and uh, turned the car end over end, spewing out his passengers out of the car as he went. And one of them was uh, Ashok Sait, and another one was DPS Sait. Uh, I don't know where he is, but I know he's in this country somewhere. And Ashok fell out of the car, and of course he was uh, badly in injured. And um, I visited him in hospital, and he, at that point, couldn't remember the name of his sister, who was living in Montreal. So um, anyway, he recovered. And he came back to, to, to finish his thesis. But the only thing was that he had notes. And, and he had brought stuff to me. And he would come to me afterwards. And he'd say, he'd say Peter, because he called me. We are a little informal. 
or sometimes he'd say, Dr. Rowe, uh, I have discovered this, that, and the other thing. Here's some new results. And I would say, Ashok, you've done that before. Go back and read your own notes. He discovered most of his main results twice, <laughs> which is really kind of interesting. Uh, and one of my students, uh, we did quite a lot of things. Uh, well, there was agricultural... Uh, oh, I must tell you about K.R. Vasudev. Uh, K.R. Vasudev, whose name is now V.K. Atri, um, I always called him K.R. And after a while, after he graduated, nobody else called him K.R. because they all called him Vasu. Um, he, he, was, he came to the University of Waterloo. He, he was my first PhD student and he arrived in, in Canada and saw the newspaper which had a big headline which said, Hotel Fire in Lucknow. Now Lucknow is a well-known city here, but it's not a well-known city in, uh, in Canada. In fact, there's a small village called Lucknow and the hotel caught on fire. And, but how was Vasu to know that, right? So he came to the electrical engineering department and he said, may I please speak to Professor Rowe? I've come to be his student. And, uh, and it happened that at that moment, I was in Tokyo, in Japan, giving a, giving a paper uh, in a conference. And uh, the department secretary said, well, I'm sorry, but Dr. Rose in Tokyo. So Vasu says, well, I'll just sit down and wait. Because he, he had learned that Lucknow was a n nearby place. <laughs> and of course, from Waterloo, you can quickly drive to London, to Paris, to Brussels, to Lisbon. They're all within. Uh, an hour's drive, and Dublin is closer. And so, so you could, and also we have a little spot which is known in Canada as Delhi, because they don't pronounce Delhi. We, we have Delhi, and that's also rather close. And we also, uh, and Kitchener Waterloo used to be called Berlin. So there are funny stories about these people. And uh, my one last student who did the bond graph analysis, he also applied, um, spent some time applying uh, graph theory to various other things like musical instruments and, uh, and to um, livestock. I saw a, um, a, a linear graph model of a pig produced by um, Stephen Burkett. So it's really quite interesting that you can think of almost anything. Burkett was a musician and, and his, his research now is mostly with a contract with the makers of grand pianos by the name of Steinway. Uh, almost all of the early contributors are retired. Uh, one of Keshevan's students who did um, um, the field theory models is still active in the department. John McPhee, whom I mentioned earlier, his, his work is with the automotive industry as big contracts with Toyota. By the way, Canada exports more Japanese cars than it imports. Uh, and uh, then there's a lot of work with MapleSoft. MapleSoft is a competitor with um, MATLAB. And, uh, and uh, all of its simulation programs are based on work done by one Chad Schmicke, who, um, who was a uh, And uh, all of their simulation programs are based on graph theoretic modeling. So you should, you should give up MATLAB and take up MapleSoft. Um, and, and I just mentioned my former student, Sean Bond Graph Model, the GTM, and he does his work. Well, now we can get to the last slide. He does his work with Steinways. I, have, what, I am still at the university, although retired since 59. That's more than, actually, it's now 50 years and two months. And uh, it was, I think, a roller coaster ride of development. It, was a, it, was, it is always great. And, I, and that's, why I'm, uh, that's why I keep looking at Prem over there, Prem. Cholera, it's always great to be in a, in a new place where you can apply new ideas in new ways, and we had an awful luck to be exactly the right age to do it. Uh, if anyone has any questions, thank you very much for listening to